Thanks. So, um, yeah, I'm David Marie Sharp. And just to give you a little bit of my background, uh, I was a modern dancer for many years. I danced with people like Lucy to Childs, Anna Sokolo, Rachel Lampert. Um, as most of you know, modern dancers are not terribly well paid um, for what they do. So I was always looking for other ways to make some money to pay the rent and do all that kind of stuff. Um, I ended up getting a temporary job down on Wall Street, which came as a fluke, uh, working on corporate takeovers and proxy fights and things like that, which I had no idea what they were talking about when I first went in there, but I learned kind of on the job. It, it developed into um, a gig where I was working 20 hours a week whenever I could fit it in, which gave me freedom to keep rehearsing and going out on tour and everything else, which was great. Another side benefit to that was that I started learning about investing and about the stock market. And this was around the time that they were starting to um, introduce mutual funds, and mutual funds were becoming much more readily available to everybody in general. I started having a lot of artist friends come up to me and say, you know, we really are interested in learning about investing, and we think it would be helpful to us, but we're kind of intimidated about going to these financial institutions and talking to them, because we don't really feel like we speak their language. Can we just ask you some questions? So I said, yeah, sure. It ended up that about nine of us got together and formed an investment group called the Thriving Artists Investment Club. We were in existence for about nine years. We met every month, put in just $25 a month to invest in, in whatever we voted on to invest in. By the time we disbanded, because uh, we were all kind of going in our separate ways, which was, as I said, about nine years later, we made about a 46 to 47% profit on the money we had invested, which made me say, you know, there's something to these artists like investing and doing that. There's something we can learn from that. Why do you think that you as an artist should take control of your finances? What do you think it would do for you? Stability? How about peace of mind? Wouldn't you like sleep? Did you just say sleep better? Yeah, hello. You know where, you're, you know where your rent's coming from, right? All of those things are true. Stability, your own personal knowledge, peace of mind. For me, one of the most important things was choice. It gave me a lot of choice in what I do as an artist. And one of my favorite stories to tell about this is back in my dance days, I was brought in to audition to be the tap dancing bumblebee for Macy's flower show, okay? So I found myself in this room with all these Macy's executives sitting in their suits and everything, and they made me put on a bumblebee costume with the hat and the little you know, antennas, and I had my tap shoes. And they said, okay, talk like a bee, and tell us, you know, do a little dance and tell us some bee jokes. And I'm not in any way saying there's anything wrong with dressing up as, as characters and doing that. But for me as a modern dancer, that was really not the direction I wanted to go in. Yeah. So luckily, I didn't get the part. And luckily, it was before YouTube. So there's no footage that exists of that. Um, but by having control of my finances, I could choose to do the work of some really great choreographers that maybe couldn't pay me as much, but was incredibly artistically rewarding for me. So that was important for me. Uh, before we talk about the feast and famine, I want to just debunk a couple myths for you, okay? One of them is artists are never going to understand how to invest, okay? Have we all felt like that? We'll never understand this. It's another language. Completely untrue. Trust me. I've worked in both worlds. It's well within your grasp to understand it. It's going to feel a little strange at first, like learning a different language, but it's totally something that you can understand and something that you can excel in. And we'll look at some of the strengths you can have that will help you excel. The other is that you need a lot of money to invest because a lot of people put off doing anything with their investments because they say, I have to wait until I have a lot of money. That is also not true. And Von Zell is going to talk a lot about how much time functions on your side. Even with small amounts of money, time is really going to benefit you. So I'm sorry, but you can't use those excuses anymore, OK? So get rid of them. You're more than capable of learning it. And whatever money you can put together, you should put to work for you because it's going to help you. Some of the strengths you have as artists that are going to help you are your creativity, all right? It's no surprise that a lot of people outside of the arts communities are not terribly creative. You're used to finding solutions in ways that other people don't think of solutions. So whether it's in finding ways to invest the little money that you have when you have it, or you know, finding other unique investments to make, use that skill. You've got it. The other thing is your counterintuition, all right? You've heard a lot about the mentality on Wall Street, the herd mentality. It's like lemmings running off the cliff. You know, as soon as there's this news, everybody runs and does this kind of investment this way, right? As artists, we're trained to go against that, right? We used to have a saying in the club, when there's blood in the streets, buy. 
and we would all go into these club meetings when everything was tanking in the market and everybody was selling, and we'd go, what are we going to buy? Because this is a time to pick up some really good deals and kind of go against the crowd. So use that to your advantage as well. And finally, your persistence, right? I never, as a dancer, went into one ballet class and said, OK, after this class, I'm going to be able to dance in Lucinda Child's comp class. <laughs> you don't do that. We're used to putting in time every single day for years and years and years to improve, right? Doesn't mean that I wasn't dancing the whole time I was improving. I was dancing with other places, but I kept working to improve, okay? The, the idea that you can put money in and get rich quick usually doesn't work for people, but use that persistence. Use your understanding that, it, that things can develop in small increments and putting the time and effort in is really gonna get you there. Apply that to your finances as well and you'll do just fine. So the habit to adopt that we're going to talk about is the feast or famine mentality and how to get away from it, OK? We've all been there. When you have a lot of money, what do you do? You spend a lot of money. When you don't have so much, you don't. I had the friend of one of the club members um, called and said, you know, he, he was a writer out in um, LA and had gone through a couple of years of, of selling a lot of screenplays and working on some television shows and was really making a lot of money. It ended. The cycle came to an end, as it's going to do. Hadn't saved a dime. And it's like, why didn't I save that, OK? Let's talk about how to get away from that. The first thing you need to do is to get a handle on how much money it takes to get you through a month. And I call that your monthly nut, all right? And what you want to do is you just want to add up all of your expenses. So we're going to run through the expenses kind of quickly. Um, just so you have an idea of the things that you should put into this calculation. So you want to put your housing costs, whether it's your rent, whatever else, your utilities. I know that utilities can vary from month to month, so just come up with an average, um, if you can, of what you think it costs for your utilities each month. Your credit card debt, all right, and, and the payments you have on that. Go with around the minimum, and not that I'm in any way implying you should pay the minimum on your credit cards, but in a month when you don't have a lot of money coming in, you're probably not going to be able to pay much more than that. So, And we're just trying to get a baseline for your monthly nut, okay? And then you're going to work your way up from that. Ideally, you don't have any credit card debt, but we all know that, that's, that there's always times that we do, right? Groceries. Um, Try to be fair with yourself. You're probably, in a, in a month, you're not making a lot of money. You don't want to live on ramen noodles and saltine crackers. But on the other hand, you're probably not going to be eating out a lot. So kind of try to find a happy medium with these things. Transportation costs, uh, insurance premiums, entertainment. Again, entertainment like your groceries. You probably aren't going to be going to Broadway every night, but you want to go out a little bit. You still have to go for your craft to see some films. Investment contributions, because you're still going to be want to, want to put some of the money from your monthly nut towards other kinds of investments that are going to make more money for you than just sitting in your savings account. And then any other expenses. Add that all up. That's your monthly nut, right? One of the things that I did that really helped me get away from the feast and famine mentality, and I really suggest you think about trying to do this, is any time I got paid any money for anything, I took the money and I put it into my savings account, OK? Everything just got funneled into my savings account, whether it was a check for work that I did, whether I found money, birthday money got from Aunt Lulu, whatever, right, into my savings account. Once a month, I paid myself a paycheck. What did I base the amount of my paycheck on? My monthly nut, right? What did that mean? It meant that months that I was making more money, bringing in more money than I needed for my monthly nut, I was actually accumulating extra money in my savings account to use in months that I maybe didn't have enough income to cover my monthly nut, all right? It really, really works. I've had people come back to me after a few years and say, oh my gosh, I'm actually saving money now because I've sort of tricked myself into getting a paycheck as if I was working for a corporation. If paying yourself once a month doesn't work, split it in half and pay yourself on the 15th and the 30th of each month. Yeah, so that you, but get into that habit of saying, this is how much money I have that I can spend this month, instead of, oh, I have all this money I can spend. The other thing that I did was 
I, I, and I'm a big Excel person, so I like to set things up in Excel spreadsheets, but some people like to write it in their notebooks or whatever, but this, I did the Excel version, okay? I set up a little spreadsheet where I allocated the money that was in my savings account into different sort of spending areas. So if you look across the top in the blue, I'll just talk through the columns. You have the date, you have the description, you have deposit withdrawal, you have paycheck column, that's the money that I was collecting to, to pay myself the paycheck each month. Special projects, which could have been anything from headshots to dance clothes to classes. My cash stash, which was my emergency cash reserve that I had, that I kept in cash. And then money that I was saving towards investments and then the total. So if we look at the top line, and hopefully I can see this with my glasses. If I say the wrong number, just pretend that I said the right one, okay? So it says balance forward, we have uh, $1,240 in my paycheck column. Right? We have 200 in special projects, 60 in the cash stash, 25 in investments, which gives me a total in the account of $1,525. Okay, so that total column, if you ever look at your, if you ever looked at your bank statement, that would be the amount that you would see in there. All right. I did a film shoot that I got paid 500 bucks for. Okay, obviously not union. Um, I of that, I allocated 400 of that towards my um, paycheck bringing that up to 1640, 90 towards special projects, and five each towards my cash stash and investments, bringing the total to 2025. Does that make sense to everybody what I'm doing here? Some sort of, I didn't. I just, I would look at the amount of money I had. If, if I was looking a little low in my paycheck column, when I got that, I would put more into that, but I would always try to build each of them up. So if you add up all those columns across, they add up to the total that's in there. So I'm basically just allocating the funds within my savings account to these to be spent on these different sort of sub areas. If you go down to the 25th, this is where I transferred money to my checking account. I paid myself the paycheck. And you'll see that I still have money left over in my paycheck towards my next paycheck, right? The other thing that this did, not only does this make you very aware of where you're spending your money, but instead of looking at your savings account and saying, wow, I've got $6,000 in there, I can go ahead and spend, when you subdivide it into, into the things that you're sort of allocating your savings for, you don't look at it as this big lump of money, right? You say, well, yeah, there's 6,000 in there, but I need new headshots and I only have 300 saved towards my headshots, so I need to wait until I get more saved up and I have this much saved towards my paycheck. Does that make sense? How much is the headshot? I don't know these days. I haven't had a headshot taken in a while. Anybody else have questions on this? This really helps too. So both of those things I really encourage you to do to sort of get yourself away from the feast and famine. These are just sort of the category headings, if you will. So the date was the date that the transaction happened, a description of what the transaction was, just so I could sort of keep track of everything. Deposit withdrawal was whether I was adding money to my savings account or taking it out. The paycheck was the column that I was saving towards the, the money I was going to pay myself each month in the paycheck. Special projects was money that I was saving, as I said, for headshots, for dance classes. You could, you could have a um, vacation fund if you wanted to add something for vacations. I mean, you can add basically any categories you want to. Um, cash stash is, is uh, your emergency cash fund. You know, you hear them talk about that a lot. You should have like six to eight months of emergency cash just in case. That's the money that I was saving for my cash stash. And then investments was uh, money that I was saving to invest in other things. If you put it into your savings account, when, as soon as it arrives, put it all in your savings account. Because then in the months that you're getting more money coming in, you're going to be accumulating that to use in the months that you don't have so much coming in. Everything that's represented in those columns is in your savings account. It's just that you're saving money towards your special projects in your savings account. Because your paycheck, you're going to pay out to yourself as well. Probably with your cash stash, you're going to move some of it into other kinds of cash savings investments to make a little bit more interest off of it. Okay? Yep. More than one savings account. I've talked, you know, there, there are a couple of online banks that will do that where they'll let you have, like, look, sort of sub-accounts set up like that. What you have to be careful of with that is sometimes, um, and some of them don't do this, but a lot of banks will charge you if you charge you account balance fees if you don't have enough in there. So for me, it was easier to have everything in one account and just me keep track of it in a spreadsheet.
So that's why I did that. But I have talked to some people who have done this who, who actually set up little sub-accounts on, online where they don't get charged for having different little sub-accounts. Let's talk about some saving strategies, because one of the things that we always talk about is, you know, we never can save money, right? Nobody can ever save money, and we never have any money to save. So let's talk about a couple. I have some friends that do this all the time. They corral their change, all right? At the end of every day, when they get home, they have like a bucket or they have a, a jar or something, and any change that they've accumulated during the day. Well, first of all, is anybody here not use cash at all? Only use credit cards for all the things? Just you only use credit cards. There's always, I'm always surprised that people don't, it's like cash, you know? So some of you just use credit card. We'll talk about what you can do, how you can do this with those as well. But for those of us that still use cash, um, they put their other change in there. I have another friend who anytime she would get a $5 bill, she wouldn't spend the $5 bill, she would put that aside. And that was part of the money that she saved. There are now credit cards that will let you round up your, um, your purchase, so that, and then they'll, they'll funnel that into a savings account. There's also apps, there are also apps. One is called Acorn, I don't know if you've heard of that, where it will round up your purchases also, but it will invest it in um, a stock fund for you. A couple things to caution you about if, for the credit card users if you're gonna do that, okay? One is if you, if you carry a balance and you get charged fees, it might not be in your best interest to do the roundup because you, 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 the fees that you're getting charged on the balance are probably going to overwhelm that. So be careful of that. The other thing is if you pay your balance off every month, great for you. But remember that let's, let's imagine that the, the maximum amount that it could ever round up is 99 cents, right? Because it, if it hits the even dollar, it's not going to round it. If it's a penny over, it's going to round it up 99 cents, OK? If you're the kind of person that has only uses credit cards and has 50 or 60 transactions a month on your credit card statement, that means with that rounding, you could potentially add around 50 or $60 to your bill. Okay, so if, if you're already kind of watching it, just be aware. You don't want that to cause you to have to start carrying a balance that then you pay interest on, okay? So those are just two kind of things to be cautious about. You also want to check and see if they charge you for it. I know Acorn charges, I think, a dollar if your balance is less than 5000 which isn't too bad. But just check to see what charges there are because you want to be sure that your money's working for you, okay? Another thing is to save bills, which we talked about. Not save bills doesn't mean don't pay your electric bill. It means like save $5 bills or save, you know, $10 bills or whatever you want to do, right? Automatic transfers are a great way to save. You set it up as if you're paying a bill. So whether it's $25, $50, even if it's, if it's sending it to another savings account that you have opened up that you say once a month, I'm just going to send this money automatically like I'm paying my cell phone bill to another savings account. Once you start opening up some of the other kind of investments that Von Zell's going to talk to you about, you can start doing automatic investments to that. What you want to do is make it so that you don't have to think about it. Because as soon as you have to think about it, you go, oh, well, maybe this, this month I won't put that $100 into my savings because I want to do something else. But if you set it up to do it automatically, it happens, it becomes like paying a bill. You'll be amazed at how fast it accumulates. Finally, have some do without days. Yeah, I always use Starbucks, and I feel like I kind of trash Starbucks a little too much. But, you know, I say people always go to Starbucks all the time, and you're paying, you know, whatever, $10 for a mocha frappuccino, Carmelita, whatever, right? You know, I don't even know how much they cost. I don't, I don't ever buy those. If you do that often, or any other habit that you find yourself spending money on frequently, Pick a day to not do that and take the money that you would have spent doing that and put it in your savings account, okay? Do without days or carry a thermos with you one day, you know, get a thermos, make your own coffee, have you have, do that, yeah? These are just some thoughts on how to save. All right, so I'll turn it over to Von Zell. Hey, good evening. Um, so a little bit about myself. Um, I work for, I do financial planning uh, estate planning and retirement planning for individuals and small businesses. Uh, before that, I worked uh, for many years in television news. Um, I also have a nonprofit where I work with uh, dancers and classical ballet. And also, I also have a law degree. So don't let anyone tell you that you can't be left and right brain at the same time. Um, you know, I, I admit that, you know, my own, my lane is more conservative. This is my idea of being creative, is this tie. Um, but I do try. 
Um, so thank you for joining me today. Um, what I want to do is have a conversation about your financial future. I have some slides uh, that I want to discuss, but I don't want you to get too distracted with the slides and like maybe some terms. I want you to start thinking about ways you can plan for your future. Okay, so um, let's get started. Okay, uh, factors that will influence your planning and what you can do to plan for your future. Um, the most important takeaway from what I'm gonna say today is one thing. I want you to have one thing in mind uh, as a takeaway from my discussion, no matter what else you hear. And that is, what do you want to do? That's probably the most important thing that you're gonna to learn today is you have to have a goal in mind. You have to know exactly what it is you want to do. Otherwise, you, you, or you won't be able to filter the things that will not work for you. Like if you're, if you're an artist, for example, and, and I say, hey, so you know, what do you wanna do? And you say, I wanna be a screenwriter. That's fantastic. I know the world's best tap dance instructor. Take his class. You would probably say, that's not in line with my goal. Exactly. It's the same idea with your finances. What do you want to do? Are you trying to save for a home? Are you going to get married and have kids? Are you about to retire in five years? Having a clear goal will help you filter all the things that will not work for you. That's the, that is the first thing you need to do is have, is have a goal. Okay. Let's, okay. The good news is we're living longer. Now, what that means is time is an asset. If you, are, if you are young and you start saving now uh, and, you know, 40 years, you're going to have a lot more money than if you have to start saving in, the, in your later years. So, you know, in 2000, you know, we were living to 86, and by 2012, we're now living to 90 years of age. Okay, your funding now is basically up to you. There was a time in which we could, get, we could count on Social Security and pensions to sort of take the place of our savings. You know, they were guaranteed, they will cover our expenses. These days you really have to take control of your finances and you have to make up the difference in you know, your cost of living and your expenses because you will not probably have social security or a pension to fall back on. If you do, that's fantastic. But these days, social security probably, will probably not be enough and most companies, I'm not sure if, if SAC has a pension, um, but you know, even if you have both, you still have to factor in your cost of living and what, is, what it is you want to do. Where do you want to live? Where do you want to retire? Do you want to retire with your spouse in Florida? Do you own a home? So these days, you kind of have to take control of, of your own finances as opposed to you know, relying on Social Security and a pension. Um, inflation. Inflation is probably, inflation and time are probably the, the biggest factors you have to worry about when it comes to planning for your future. Uh, as I said before, you know, time, time is really, can really be an asset if you use it correctly. The cost of waiting. All right, Susan began investing $1,000 at age 30. By age 40, she stopped investing. But now age 65, her 10,000 contribution has grown to 59,000 964, and she's 30 years old, 10 years of investing. She invested $1,000 into an IRA. She got about 6%, and by 65, she had almost $60,000. By comparison, Ken started at age 45, $1,000 a year, same IRA. By 65, he had $38,000. The big difference here, the big difference here is a thing called compound interest in time. Compound interest works this way. If you have an investment for $100 and you make 10%, you've now got 110. You're now gonna get interest on the 110. It's gonna compound. So you're making money on your money. No, say, so here's the difference, okay. Okay, she, okay her, she stopped investing after 10 years, whereas he invested for 20 years. So in the, short, in the time that he stopped, if she had continued to invest, it would be even greater, but she stopped. You see, you see what I'm saying? She stopped investing for, she only did it for 10 years. He did it, he did it for 20 years. Any percentage has more value. But she had more time. Yeah. She had, right, so exactly, so the, the key is 
time. She had more time to invest. So time is an asset. Okay. All right, so the, so the point of this is to not procrastinate. The, t the time is an asset. Um, and that, you know, the sooner you get started, uh, the more you can, the more you can save, the more you can build, the more you can grow. Okay, so um, this is a general rule about how you sort of gauge your investment. They call it the rule of seventy-two, uh, and the way it works is, you know, uh, you divide, you divide whatever your interest rate is by. I'm sorry, you divide seventy-two by your interest rate that you're getting, and that will sort of tell you how fast your money will double. It's a very sort of loose rule. So if you, you know, if you if you found some, someone that gives you ten percent, and you divide 10, uh, seventy-two by ten percent, that means in seven point two years your money will double. It's it's not a it's not a it's not a hard rule, but it's a way of sort of gauging how much if you are getting five percent or six percent, how quickly it will take for your money to double. So another example, you know, if you're getting six percent. Um, you know, it will take 12 years for pre-tax for your money to double, and then if you're getting, you know, 4%, it will take 18 years. And again, they're factoring in taxes. And we'll talk about taxes and what kind of investments you can use that are tax deferred and tax, you know, tax delayed coming up. Tax deferred accumulation. Tax deferred means that as your investments grow, as you're getting paid interest and dividends, you will not pay taxes on that Growth, all right. So you kind of want to stay. You, know, you you kind of want to steer. Well, the benefits of, ta of being tax deferred is that when you later on in life, the idea is that you're going to be in a lower tax bracket. So you you so when you do take the money out, you'll pay less taxes because you're in a lower tax bracket. As you get older, now the best case scenario is that you're in a high tax bracket, and that's a, a great problem to have. But you know, with tax deferred, the idea is as you get older, you'll be in a lower tax bracket. And so you'll, when you pay taxes, you'll be, you'll be paying less taxes. So tax deferred allows your money to grow in the account without your having to pay taxes until you, just, until you draw it out. Tax deferred means you defer your taxes until later. So you buy, say, uh, a life insurance policy or an annuity, and you're accumulating based on interest and or dividends or, you know, as it, you know to, to grow. Uh, the, money you're, the money you're earning... Does not you don't have to pay taxes on it until you take it out of the account. So if it's you know if it's an IRA, 59 and a half, or you know, you don't pay taxes until you take it out. So ideally you'll be in a lower tax bracket as you get older. Or you or you could not, and that's a great problem to have. And if you take it out over six years, say you, you accumulated two hundred thousand uh, dollars in your investments over your full career. And if you take it out right away, you get heavily taxed. Depends on what it, it depends on. Yeah, but it depends on what you're taking out when and for. Because yeah. there are there are loopholes. Yeah. There are loopholes. You know, you can take out you know, without penalties. But yeah, you if you take it out early, early withdrawal, there's usually like a ten percent penalty somewhere around that somewhere around yeah. there. Tax twice. Though. And you basically you're basically taxed twice. <laughs> yeah. So um, the idea is with tax deferred is you will pay taxes later on while it builds and grows. You won't pay taxes on it. Okay, so again, any questions about tax deferral? And again, they usually work best for long-term long -term planning. Okay, so uh, before we start talking about products, let's you know, keep in mind, as David said, there are no quick fixes. There, there is no magic bullet. There is no stock that you can buy, and all of a sudden you're a millionaire in two weeks. If that's the case, please call me. <laughs> I would love to know. Um, Again, you know, just you know, you know, we'll talk product, but you know, just be realistic. You have you have to take control of your finances. You know, you can't just pass it off to someone and have them do it for you. You have to do it, and as you do it, you build confidence. This is all about building confidence. All right. Okay, let's talk some basic strategies. Now, I picked these for two reasons. One, the cost of entry is relatively low. Okay, you don't have to have a huge investment for any, for any of these. Um, you also can structure the premiums. When you pay the premiums, you can structure how much you pay. Um, again, when you pay. Um, so it's, you know, it's, you know, I, I picked these because they're a very good sort of first step to start investing. 
you know, um, you know, obviously, you know, everyone thinks about stocks. Stocks are great, um, but you need to be a little bit more sophisticated with stocks because, you know, you, you know, you start gambling in, in, in the casino. The more you gamble, you know, you can make a huge payout or you can lose everything. So these are sort of basic, sort of basic uh, entries. All right, the first thing is an annuity. An annuity is a contract between you and an insurance company, which you give them a lump sum, and then they pay you a distribution. Now, originally, there was usually only one kind of, annu of an annuity. It was a fixed annuity. You give me $10,000 or $100,000, and I'll pay you X amount based on your age uh, for either the rest of your life or for, or for a fixed moment in time. Now, there are many different types of annuities. You can cater them to, you know, basically whatever you like. For instance, um, you can have an annuity that will pay you for, say, 10 years, and then the, then the remainder goes to your beneficiary. You can have an annuity that pays you for life. You can have an annuity that pays you and your, you and your spouse for life. Um, you can have an annuity that has um, entry into the market. Um, you can have an annuity that's hedged against inflation. Um, but essentially, it's a contract between you and the insurance company. Again, you know, you, don't, you only need maybe, you know, a few thousand dollars to start maybe, you know, three, four, five, get you started, and you can contribute different premiums along the way. Okay, it's a very low entry, to, low low barrier to entry, and again, you can have things called a variable annuity, which allows you to invest in the market, meaning you can invest in mutual funds, you can invest in growth stocks, you know, you can take some measure of risk. Um, but again, you can also you can also have things called riders, which will prevent you from losing your money. You can say, you know, I'm going to have hundred thousand dollars. I'm going to have a rider that says, you know. At the end, I will guarantee, you'll get a guarantee, you will preserve that money, okay? So you can customize annuities to fit your needs. What's great about them is you, you, can, opt, you can opt for what's called lifetime payments, which means they will pay you until you die. You cannot outlive a life payment. So for instance, if you give me or give, you, give whoever, $50,000 and you're, you know, 20 something, and you, based on the disbursement, you live to your 200. They have to sort of keep, they still have to keep paying you. Even if you outlive the principal, it's called a fixed life annuity. It's called a life annuity. They pay you for life. Now, of course, the downside is because you, because they're calculating that you're gonna live for a very long time. The, pr the payment is usually a little bit lower than if you say, I'm going to do it for 10 years. So life, life is great because you can never outlive it. But the downside is it's usually a lower, a lower disbursement because they're planning for you to live, you know, a long time. Um, IRAs. There, any questions about annuities? What's the NSO insurance? They have, they, well, because some people are going to die. <laughs> well, okay. Everyone's gonna die, but the yeah, but, you know, but some people actually like you know if you you could you know. Uh, I have an uncle who just turned one hundred last October. That, fantastic, but you know, it's like let's say let's say you gave one hundred thousand dollars and then you died two years into it, they would keep your money, right? So I know everyone just kind of groaned like. Oh. <laughs> See that's why that's again like, and that's sort of the that's the, the the annuity in a nutshell. But you can tailor it. You can say I only want you to pay me for ten years. Okay, uh, and if you live, and if you live past the ten years, or, you know, if you live past, well, if you die in that ten years, the, the remainder goes to your beneficiary, just like that's just like a regular life insurance policy. So you can you can tailor it. If you die in a, if you have a life payment and you die before you go through all of your premium, let's say you get hundred thousand dollars, they would keep that portion. Just for the life one, or correct, or correct, correct, okay. correct. So you can have again, you can tailor these because originally it was it was a life one. You basically give me the money, I'll pay you for life. But if you should die before you exhaust it, that's sort of the way it goes. But again, these, you know, I picked them because, you know, annuity is it's a low cost to entry. You can make a premium payment. You can, you can set premium payments sort of, you know, to sort of accommodate a different sort of pay schedule. If you don't get, you can 
put a lump sum once a year, you can do maybe do a quarter, maybe you know, every month. You can sort of, is flexibility here for your payment. Um, it's a great way to sort of give yourself, yourself a pension because again, you know, if you have a pension, that's fantastic, but it's a great way to sort of create your own pension. Um, IRAs, there are two types of IRAs. There are IRAs and there are traditional and Roth IRAs. The big distinction uh, with a Roth and with an IRA is a Roth is sort of after-tax money, meaning you've already paid taxes on it, whereas Roth is, tends to be pre-tax money. Um, the difference, the big distinction is if you want to withdraw your contribution to a Roth IRA, your contribution, not your earnings, you can do so at any time. There's no penalty, there's no early withdrawal. On, on, on taking out your, what you put in, with it's after tax money, you've already paid taxes on it. So you can take it out whenever you want because it's already been, it's already been taxed. All right, but with, with the traditional IRA, if you withdraw early, there is a 10% usually early withdrawal fee because it's sort of pre-tax money. I mean, you know, IRAs and, you know, IRAs are investing accounts. They're basically the glorified savings accounts that companies basically have your money in it. You know, when you give your money to a company, they're investing it. That's what, it's not just sort of sitting somewhere, you know, it's not, it's not just sort of sitting there being held for you. Their idea is you're loaning them the right to use your money to make more money. That's kind of how it works, sort of a give and take. You know, you know, with, 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 with every institution, many institutions have sort of their own sort of hybrids of different products. You could have, you know, there are IRAs or sort of, you know, it's what they call the term wrap them in annuities. Uh, and so what you think, you know, they sort of use your money to sort of like invest in sort of, you know, Roth type investments, but then they pay you as an annuity. So there are all types of hybrids. So that could be a hybrid that some companies just kind of offer. Um, but, you know, traditionally most IRAs, Roth IRAs, they use your money to invest to make more money for the company. That's kind of how it works with all investments. So, you know, the idea that you're giving, you're loaning your money away to companies, and they're using it to make more money. And then in exchange, they're going to be paying you based on whatever product you've used. Okay, so uh, with Roth and traditional, the big difference is one is pre-tax money. You haven't paid taxes on it yet. One is post-tax money. You've already paid taxes on it. You have it in your savings account. You open an IRA. You can do so. You can withdraw the money. Uh, you're, you can withdraw your contributions without taxes. Now, if you withdraw the earnings, that's a different story. But even with even with, with Roth IRAs, even if you do want to withdraw the earnings, you can in certain instances like disability or maybe for, for a house. There are there are sort of exemptions for Roths that will allow you to take out even the earnings for certain limited purposes. Okay. What's great about them is you don't need a lot of money. Low barriers to entry. You need you know depending on who you choose. Two, three thousand dollars, something like that. You can structure the payments, the frequency. Um, there is a cap per year on how much you can put into a Roth and to a traditional IRA. It's around fifty five hundred per year. Wow. You can have around fifty five hundred per year. If you're over fifty, you can get extra extra thousand um, dollars. But that's the maximum. So if you have a Roth and an IRA traditionally together, you cannot exceed the fifty five hundred dollars. So that's the maximum. Um, you know, again, if your issue is you have too much money, that's we can have another discussion. It's fine. Um, but this is for, this is sort of like you know for people you know who want to start saving, um, you know, low cost, low barriers to entry, you know, and get a decent sort of return. Mutual funds act the same way. They're kind of like four hundred one k sort of. You know, you pool your money with other people and you all buy shares of something. Um, it's a way to sort of leverage to leverage other people's money. Um, to 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 invest, you all it's kind of like owning a a co-op. Everyone owns the co-op collectively. It's sort of like it's like a co-op. You know what I mean? You own shares sort of together. You know, um, you you know, yeah. You know, there are as many mutual funds as there are snowflakes. They can invest in uh, money markets. They can invest in bonds. They can invest in growth stocks. They can invest in whatever you like. Um, but it's a way for you to leverage sort of access to investments through a pool of people, like a, like a, like a co-op. Um, and usually you can structure, you can structure uh, how much you put in, the frequency, you know, you want to do it you know, once a month, once a year, every six months. Uh, they're pretty easy to turn around if you need, if you need the money. Um, you know, the idea is, you know, is these are long-term investments are not something, you, it's not a, you know, piggy bank. But if you do need to sort of get the money out, it's not as difficult and, you can turn the shares around pretty quickly and pretty easily. So, um, 
so you know it's a, it's a it's an it's an option. Um, and then lastly, it will be we're talking about life insurance. Um, you know, there is there is what we call it sort of and I hate, to, I hate to use the word. People think of life insurance like death insurance. It's like only it's only when you die, and that is you know term insurance, which is been, which, which is a very useful it's a very useful product depending on what your needs are. Um, there's also you know what's called uh, whole life insurance, whole life insurance, permanent insurance, which allows you to build cash accumulation. Um, you know, depending on which company you go with, some are paying around four uh, percent. Some offer dividends. Um, and this is all, again, this is all tax deferred. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Well, so life insurance, actually, it's, it's basically tax-free. Um, the death benefit and the accumulation is tax-free. Um, you know, again, you can, you can structure your payments every month, every six months, every quarter. Um, you, know, you know, depending on what you want to do, you can leverage access to a large death benefit. And again, with permanent insurance, you're allowed, you can accumulate money, at, you know, somewhere around like 4%, depending on who you're, who you're talking to. Um, but again, you know, it's a, it's a low barrier to entry. Um, the overriding thing that these four will fit into is the idea that you have to figure out what it is you want to do. That's the only thing I kind of really want to nail down is what, is, what do you want to do? And if you figure that out and, you, and you're very specific about it, you can, you will, if someone comes to you with something that sounds too good to be true, it, and it doesn't fit into your, your plan, then you can sort of filter it. But if you, if you don't have a very clear goal about what you want to do and where you are in your life, uh, you're going to have a, it's going it's to be kind of overwhelm you. Do you know what I mean? Um, if I, you know, if, you know, if you're, if you're 20 and you say, oh, I want to plan for, to buy a house in 10 years, the house costs this much. You're going to look for things that will give you the return to allow you to build to have X amount in X number of years. That's kind of how it works. I mean, it's the, the more vague you are, the more you're going to be sort of blowing in the wind. And say, oh, man, if someone comes to you and says, oh, I have this really great stock, it'll make you rich in five years. If you don't have a goal or you're kind of like, oh, I'm behind, I haven't done anything, you're going to jump on it. And that's how people lose money and they lose faith in the whole process because everyone wants a, you know, a magic bullet, a get rich quick scheme. It just does not work, guys. It just doesn't work. You have to do the work. You have to do the slow and steady wins the race. It just kind of does. Now, again, if you have a friend who has a, who's developing an app in Silicon Valley and you know it's going to become the next Facebook, by all means, jump on it and call me immediately. But for most people, they don't have the inside track. They have to do sort of slow, steady, mutual funds, bonds, IRAs, life insurance. You build a foundation of sort of the safe, kind of boring things. You build a foundation. And then when you're established, then take risk. Take risk, buy stock, buy all these things. It's great, but build a foundation. These things will build a foundation for you. And then you can, you know, the sky's the limit. I picked these because these, these kind of, they, they go with you when you go somewhere. Like, you know, if you have a 401k and you lose your job, you tend to lose it. You know, if you have insurance with your, if you have insurance with your, with your job, life insurance, you get fired, you tend to lose it. Um, these are things you can buy on your own, more or less. Uh, you can own your own IRA. You know, the, you know, the flip side of an IRA is like 401k. Individual retirement accounts, individual. You own it, belongs to you. All of these things you own individually. I mean, if you travel, take another job, doesn't really matter. They travel with you. That's why I kind of pick these guys. But, you know, or just tend to be, so look at the gypsies, you guys travel. These go with you. A lot of times if you leave, if you leave an account like a 401k sitting, there are usually fees associated with it, just having the account being held there. You can do that. You can leave it there. Uh, it's not, you know, your money isn't working for you. It's just sort of sitting there. Um, issues there, sometimes fees, but it's not anything detrimental if you leave your 401k or something sitting there. I mean, ideally, you want to roll in something that's actually going to work for you, but it's nothing wrong if you did decide to leave it wherever you left. There's no, it's not like you have to leave or it's going to, they're going to each, they're not going to take your money. They won't like absorb the 401k. They're not going to get into it. They're not going to. It just won't be working for you. It depends. You know, you know it's uh, rollovers are essentially free. You don't have to. You know, if you roll something over, it's not. There's, there are no really fees involved. Uh, you don't have to. If to roll the, the, the actual no the actual rolling over. If you transfer like your 401k into like an IRA to like a 
into an annuity, there's no, a rollover is, a, is a kind of like a window of opportunity to allow you to transfer from one type of product into another without paying any cost associated with it. That's all I have. So I think we're gonna have. I think we're gonna do a question and answer. I'm not sure what's left, but um. risk is a, an important thing to have to think about because <clears throat> as soon as you want to start investing, you have to think about how much risk you're willing to take on. And I would say risk with investing is very different than risk as a performer, right? We like to take risks as performers, less so with our investments. <clears throat> so remember that the any time you have <clears throat> investments in cash accounts they're automatically incredibly low risk, which means they're low reward. That's just the way it is. Now, you can look, I'm glad you mentioned the um, Actress Federal Credit Union. SAG also has a credit union. If you've, if you've never looked into credit unions and you only have bank accounts, I would encourage you to look into credit unions, particularly one that's affiliated with one of our unions, like the Actress Federal Credit Union or the Screen Actress, for a couple reasons. I'm gonna just digress for a second on that. One, they're used to working with artists. So they understand the issues that you have. Because of the way credit unions are organized, they're organized as not-for-profits, so they generally pay a slightly higher interest rate on their um, investment accounts, like savings accounts, and they usually have lower rates on their credit cards and other kinds of loans. So they're really good. I have one of each. I have a bank and a credit union account, just to, for diversification purposes and to sort of have money in different places, right? So one of the things, if you're only interested in cash at the moment, usually I tell people, you know, we talked a little bit about having a cash stash and month, you know, want to have several monthly nuts in your cash stash. If at the moment you have zero monthly nuts saved in your cash stash, you probably want to get one or two under your belt before you start looking at other types of investments, okay? Because you want to have that in reserve. For your cash accounts, look at some of the online savings accounts that your bank or the credit union might have, because you might be able to tweak a little bit more interest out of those. Look at certificates of deposit, which again are cash, but there's a restriction on how long you can take them out before you um, get penalized. The next step up the ladder for me was always if, if um, you wanted to go, you're not really willing to take too much risk, but you kind of want to put your toe in the water, look at US government bonds like savings bonds, um, treasury notes. You can get, there's, there's, a, there's a savings bond. You remember, everybody knows what a savings bond, probably some of those of us who were old enough to, to have gotten this. When we graduated from high school, Aunt Velma gave you a little savings bond that was like the little paper thing, and it was like 25 bucks, whatever, and it accumulated, right? They only exist electronically anymore. You can go online to treasurydirect.gov, you can get the, the Series E still exists, but there's a new one called a Series I bond, which is the interest rate on it is indexed for inflation. It changes every six months based on inflation. I think the last time I looked, it was paying about 1.4% interest. There's some restrictions. You can't take it out for five years. What do you think the minimum is to buy a, an I bond, a US I bond, if you go directly to the online to the government? 25 bucks. So there isn't anybody in this room that can't put 25 bucks in a Series I bond, right? So those kinds of things. The, the, they also have treasury notes, which are um, longer term, but have a little bit more f um, flexibility in terms of getting out of them. Um, the minimum for the treasury notes and bonds are $100, which still is very manageable for people, right? And you just set it up online, do that. The only way that you, you are at risk for those is if the US government goes bankrupt, which Again, in this election year, who knows? <laughs> but um, but if, if the US government goes bankrupt and can't pay back the bonds, we're all gonna have a lot more to worry about than the 25 bucks we put in our Series I bond. So that's probably the next safest if you're really risk adverse. Mutual funds are also a great, you can get mutual funds that invest in bonds. And money market accounts and treasure, treasure bills. This is a way, I mean, you, that's a, you know, fantastic. You can actually do it yourself, um, or you can sort of leverage the pool of like a mutual fund. That, you know, you and your, you know, you're taking, a, you're sharing a risk with other people. You're all investing together, but you can find mutual funds that will invest in treasure bills and T bills and all those things. Okay, hi. I, well, so far we've been talking about uh, pre traditional uh, money products, you know, the IRAs, the annuities, the you know, uh, CDs, et cetera. Um, so I, what I would like to ask is, um, uh, outside of, of finding out uh, what Susie Orman has to say or, or Clark Howard or somebody like that, um, are there uh, some other more interesting and maybe newer products 
uh, and ways of getting information about them, things like the bitcoins and the and you know currency trading and and things that are you know on the lower end. However, we can make use of them if we are have a little little uh, little grit and uh, and. Uh, are interested? Are, are there ways of finding out more about this, uh, about those kinds of products? And I'm interested in finding out how you, your club, fared, and the different types of things you used. Sure, um, I'll start and let you jump in. Um, I'm a big proponent of first having a, a solid, diversified core portfolio that exists of cash, bonds, and stock. Okay. Once you've got that under your belt, and the diversification is important because it protects you against fluctuations in the market, everything else. I also tell people, okay, if you have if you have a, a portfolio that's a thousand dollars, putting a thousand dollars at tremendous risk is scary because that's everything. If, that, if that's all you have, if you once you get a portfolio up to ten thousand dollars, thousand dollars is still scary, but not quite as scary as losing everything, right? Once it's a hundred thousand dollar portfolio, that's a core portfolio. A thousand suddenly is easier to play with, and once you have a million dollar portfolio, a thousand dollars is like jump change, right? So, really build the core out. Once you get the core, there are a lot of peripheral investment things like that. There's also ways of getting into those other kinds of investments without taking as much risk as you know going into it. So, for example. A lot of people are very interested in gold. I always get a lot of people saying, what about gold? Because, you know, blah, 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 blah. So, yeah. Aside from wanting to have a bunch of gold bullion in your closet, which some people do, there's ways you can get mutual funds that, have, that invest in gold companies. Or you can get ETFs, exchange-traded funds, which are another sort of product very similar to mutual funds, but trade on the market. Bitcoin is Bitcoin in the virtual currencies. You can buy those directly from Bitcoin. There are currency trading platforms out there on the internet, if you search for them, that are you know licensed platforms that you do currency trading. Always understand the risk that you're taking when you're going into products like that. And try to research them and see who else is using them. Because you don't want to get yourself into some kind of a scam if you're willing to do that. And if you have the stomach for it, the, as the investment club, we only invested in stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. That was a limitation of the club. Club members could do whatever they wanted to do outside of that. That was the core portfolio for us. And we were limited by our own self-written bylaws to not go to you know, derivatives even or anything like that. We stayed with the core portfolio. You can, I mean, most of the big you know, trading companies or even small ones, you can go on like Ameritrade, you can find people, you can find brokers who will work with you? Because um, you know it's a you know they, they're wasn't happy to sort of sell you bitcoins or sell you companies that invest in bitcoins or sell you you know exchange traded exchange traded funds. Um, you know again there, you know there's risk involved, um, and you know I you know I don't I'm not sort of anti risk I'm not anti you know these things. Um, but, you know but you know you you generally, you generally have to be willing to lose money because you know you can't you know the stock market is not something you just sort of put money in and pull out like a piggy bank or like a slot machine. So like it's fine. Okay, all the all the trading houses will welcome you if you want to invest in Bitcoin or exchange for trade funds. Um, but know that you know just from a, as if you are a sophisticated investor uh, as opposed to a novice. I mean, I would always encourage you to sort of like have a stomach for like a roller coaster. Have a stomach for it. if you want you if you, if you invest in something or a stock and you see it dip, don't just run and get your money out because then that's kind of how it is. You have to kind of you know it's not it's not it's how long you want to stay in the market. And most of the time, if you're in the market for you know. 10 years or so, 20 years, you, you sort of have a decent return on your investment. But they, again, this, you know, don't look, if you're looking for a quick fix, a magic pill, you know, you could, you know, you could make a lot of money, but you can also lose a lot of money. So the, most of the brokers, huge brokers firms will be more than happy to give you a broker to call, who will, you know, work with you for anything you want to invest in. It's just, you know, it's, it's your risk, it's your level of risk. Tolerance. For you're risk. looking to play, I think. You're not. Yeah, if you want to play, yeah, then, you know, you're looking to play. People, but also look at, there's, 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 there are a couple of really good online sources of information. Like Yahoo Finance is a, is a great 
source of information as well. If you're just looking to research it before you actually talk to a broker, Investopedia I use a lot too. Yeah, that's a great which, one. That's and a they great have one. They, they have everything. They'll have right. links embedded in it. So um, whatever you put in, if you put in currency trading, it will come up with and it will give you a definition of it. It will give you links to places like that. So have a look at some of those um, sort of online information sources to sort of narrow down what you think you might want to do. And then they'll also help guide you to whether you need to go through a broker or that's the best way to go or whether there's another online platform for that. And it will also give you a sense of the risk level that you're taking. So, yeah. Investopedia is great. Yeah. Hi. Um, I lost quite a bit of money over the last seven years in part because I'm so risk averse. And um, I kept thinking, surely, you know, that um, interest rates were going to go up. So do you have any tips in particular outside of the savings bonds uh, um, idea, which is helpful, but I need a little bit more than, than 2% or, 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 or less um, interest? Um, and one of my questions actually is, uh, in particular, David, have you ever done any counseling, especially for people who are, have a hard time with risk? Mm -hmm. I do, I do a lot of teaching. I teach at, regularly at HB Studio, Herbert Burgoff and Uta Hawkins Acting Studio in the, in the village. And the classes are free there, so I teach every other month a class. Um, you just have to sign up with the studio. So by all means, look at that if you want to come to some other classes. And I um, also post on my website other classes that I teach. So mostly it's in a class setting, that I, the work that I do. Um, I really think that... Um, for more risk adverse, and I'm gonna then turn it over to Vanzel because I think it's more in his area, is definitely annuities are gonna probably be a safer investment for you, but give you a, a better return than like a savings bond. And mutual funds are another area that I would look at. Um, but remember, there's types of mutual funds, well, there's types of mutual funds that are a blend of bonds and stock. So you're not, you're getting sort of a more balanced portfolio. So you're not putting the, the money is in at risk just on the stock side. It has bonds to help temper the risk. So there's such a wide variety of mutual funds, which you'll agree. There's something for everything. I just got two really quick ones for you. Um, the first one is, is there a duration on a mutual fund or is that just once you put it in, it stays with you and it, you can take it out or put it back in whenever you want? Or is it like a five-year thing? Like you're committing to a five-year? No. Okay, and then the second question is, I've, I've heard sort of like backhaul talk of actors who set themselves up as corporations, and usually that's when you're making so much money that that's like the logical thing to do. But is there any reason to do that if, if you're not, or if you're like in a lower income range, is there any reason to ever set yourself up as a corporation? When you say corporation, it sort of depends on what you're talking about, whether you're an like LLC, or sort of LLC. It, there are, there are different types of LLCs, and you need to talk probably talk to a, to uh, to an attorney about that in particular. But a lot of LLCs are what are called pass through LLCs. Basically, you basically your your tax at the personal level, the money just kind of passes through. Um, you know, depending on what what you're doing, I guess you know maybe some tax write off advantages. Uh, if, if you have like intellectual property that you're putting out, if you're also like not only like an actor, but you have you have you're creating things that would have their own financial life to it. Again, I guess the issue is, I mean, if you're, if you say you're saying you're creating things, are you, are you having them trademarked? Are they copyrighted? I mean, they're so like, say, like an actor who also is a writer, you know, and they have, um, they have like a, a play or like a literary agent. So they have income coming in from multiple sources. Um, would being an LLC be like an umbrella solution to that? An LLC is basically just a tax thing. It's, a, it's basically just it's just a, it's just a tax thing. It doesn't it's, it is, you know if you have an S corporation like a CBS that's a that's a, an actual corporation or shareholder or it becomes about you know um, that. But if you're an LLC or yeah, it's oversimplifying, it's basically a pass through, and everything that you make just kind of passes through it. So you're not necessarily getting you know taxes on tax breaks on your necessarily your income. Um, there is a, there's a there's a separate type that is, this is allow it. I'm not sure what you know which type of LLC you're talking about, but there is a certain type that allows you some sort of some sort of like hybrid between an LLC and an S core. Uh, but essentially, LLCs are basically pass throughs. So um, so it's basically it doesn't really matter unless it won't matter as far as your income, as far as you know, it won't it won't necessarily matter as far as your income. Right. Uh, you talk to a good. Uh, you need to have a good accountant. I won't say what you can write, what you can or cannot write off. Next question right here. 
Hi. Uh, as far as diversification, um, I've been hearing quite a bit about target date funds, and I wanted to know your opinion about that. Target date funds? I'm not yes. Um, the, yeah, you, usually you get those in the re, in your retirement funds, and basically right. what they are, you you determine that the the date at which you're going to be of mm -hmm. retirement age, and that's the the year of the fund you buy. So mm -hmm. if you're going to be you know 59 and a half in you know whatever 2060 or whatever, you would buy a 2000. What they do is, you know, there, there's an idea with diverse when you when you're diversified between bonds and stock that as you start approaching retirement age, you start shifting your assets from stocks, which are higher risk and, and subject to more volatility, into bonds, which tend to be steadier and pay a regular amount of money, right? These target date funds are comprised of a stock and bond components. Mm -hmm. As you approach your retirement age, that fund does that for you. Mm -hmm. They shift it. And the idea is that when you have to start taking money out, if, if you happen to need to take money out when the market has just crashed, which it does inevitably, there's, mm -hmm. you know, it's peaks and valleys, that most of your money is in bonds which haven't suffered right. that so you can take it out. So that's what they're, they're doing that automatically for you. So if you are 30 years from the target date, it's probably gonna be very heavily weighted in stock and, and only a little in bonds. And as you reach that, that target date, when you're gonna be able to, you know, take it out, it will have shifted to be more bond oriented. That's what I thought. Thank you for the clarification. Um, I think I'm a little confused on the life insurance investment. Um, can you just talk more about it? Because is it a, a policy for yourself? Uh, yeah, it's a policy. It's a policy for yourself. Um, you can take policies out on other people, but you have to have some sort of interest in the other person. Like you, you know, say it's your son, your daughter, your, or your family member. You have to have. To have you have to have. Um, it's, it's essentially, you know, uh, there are two types. There's there there is temporary insurance and there's permanent insurance. Temporary insurance doesn't have a cash value accumulation. You can't grow money. It's basically sort of they call it the death benefit. The be death right. benefit. Okay. Uh, it's usually for a, it's for a term, like for five years, 10 years, or 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you were to die, your beneficiary would get X amount of money. Yeah. Um, it tends to be lower, it tends to be uh, cheaper, or less expensive, um, because, you know, there's no cash accumulation associated with it. And it's for a fixed amount of time. Um, and then there's permanent insurance, which is until, which is for, you know, it doesn't, it does not expire. It's for your entire life. Um, and with it, there is a cash value. Um, in which you your premium that you pay in each month is combined with a interest with an interest rate and sometimes dividends to grow your to grow your account and that money can be taken out tax free and used for virtually any purpose Absolutely. that's permanent insurance it's more expensive uh, but again there is a, it's a savings benefit associated with it. Okay. Um, so just one on top of that. Um, so if you have a life insurance policy, correct. I don't know. If it's either one, but if for some reason you lose it, you can't stop, or you have, you can't pay it anymore, um, it's just it's just gone. Then you get nothing. Uh, it depends. Uh, that with depends a, with, what with, it is. With a uh, with a temporary with a temporary policy, yes. Uh, once if you don't pay it, 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 it lapses. It will lapse. Okay. There are there are usually some that there's a window in which if you haven't paid for a couple of months, you can you can sort of go back and pay it and sort of pick it back up. Uh, but it will lapse. And if it's a term policy, you know. You've lost your premium, and you lost your coverage. If you want additional coverage, uh, it's based on the age you are now. So mm -hmm. let's say you you know you let it lapse, and then five years later you want coverage, mm -hmm. uh, the rate will go will be higher because you're now five years older. Uh, with the whole life policy, if it were to lapse, there are options. A lot of times they can will convert the policy uh, to a smaller policy that's called paid up that's already paid up. Uh, let's say hundred thousand dollars, and you basically your premiums have basically accumulated to about you know, 50,000. If you lapse the policy, they will e you can either have that policy that you've, the money you've paid convert to what's called a paid up policy and it's already paid up and it's done, mm -hmm. um, or they can return your, they can return your premium. Okay. But you would, if you have a permanent policy, you would not, you know, they can't just sort of take the money. Okay. They, you will, you will get a, you will get a refund at the very least. Gotcha. Thank you. I actually had a quick question about 401k, which is that, um, why is it that you can't just give to your 401k? Like, I have a 401k through Actors' Equity, but you can only give to it 
when you're on a LORT contract. Because it's a it's a it's a company thing that allows companies to when they contribute as right, well. Right, because they get all they get all kind of tax incentives and breaks for having a 401k for their employees. So that's a benefit that companies have. Right. So you're, you're just you're the you're the you know you're you it's like it's like uh, your life insurance. You know, comp companies all through life insurance because they get benefits from having group policies. Do mm -hmm. so, you know what I mean? It's cheaper for them to have group policies. So these benefits they have incentives, they, the companies get, get benefits from it. So um, when you leave, you no longer you no longer have access to the sort of company benefits, which is the 401ks are company things. Like 403Bs are also, you know, they're more for nonprofits and teachers in, in the schools, but they're more of a yeah. lar for large groups of people to... It just, it does so much better than my IRA. I wanted to put all that money in there but because you you're you're pooling your money with other yeah. people it's like it's like the, it's like uh you're you and ev you and everyone's sharing the risk mm -hmm. so you're pooling money so of course it will do better than if you individually put in 10 bucks a month into a piggy bank it will all, you know what i mean you're pooling money no, so that's why it's put it in there yeah even they, if they, they didn't they, contribute anything. They like, contribute. They offer. They offer matches just let me put and that kind of thing. In there. <laughs> just get more lort contracts. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> we probably have time for one or two more questions. Are there any questions? Uh, I just am wondering. So I've been hearing uh, something about these new apps that sort of do asset allocation for you. Do you? Uh, know about these um at, would are there any that you su might suggest that are that you think are better I, as i said i i just have heard about them i don't really know but do you know any of these apps well the one i had mentioned was acorn which um is the one that rounds that, up that automatically puts money into your savings but this is no 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 oh oh it also does asset allocation but like it, if the market you when you tanks, when you sign up for acorn you have a choice depending on your level of risk of what you want the money it's taking to invest in and right. it invest it basically in like a mutual fund of stocks. So it's, and, but it, you tell it how much risk you want to take and that's where it will direct your, your, um, oh, the, investments. Okay. Uh, that may be a different type. I'm thinking of something like say the stock market like last summer falls down a lot, a big, big, huge drop or something. And based on your age, you have so much in stocks, so much in bonds, so much in this. You it will tell you. Would, like, go, it will tell you. Yeah. Mm -mm. That you don't. You're not. I'm not. I know. Like a, uh, apps like Mint, which help keep track of your budgeting and things like that. Yeah. No, I have this not is heard something of that, like that that based no. like you know you have so much in gold, you have so much in. So real you would estate, basically you tell have, it and, where and, all of your investments are, and it would tell you. And it'll right. tell you it uses no. like algorithms to I've after the market of. goes down now, you know, because now you fluctuated it in your proportions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've okay, I just of, wondered if you knew one that you, was better than another. If anybody knows any names of any, email me though, because I'd be curious to know what they are. Because I've not heard. Have you? No, I've not heard of anything like that. Okay. But um, if you hear of one, yeah, email it to me. Yeah, there's supposed to be some really great ones. It's all cutting edge uh, There's so technology. many apps that come out these days that, um, you know, and I'll keep my eyes out too because okay, uh, now that you. you mentioned it, yeah. Yep, we'll just quickly, um, we'll just with that Acorn app, would you suggest that as something in addition to working with like a real life person or sort of a starter or could it just be your thing in the beginning? I always tell, particularly people in the arts, I say, look, there's no formula for you, for everybody in this room. If I talk to ev each one of you individually, we would come up with a completely different path that each of you needs to take. If I talk to you two years from now, that path would be even different than it is now. So what you, your responsibility, and it's particularly true for artists because our lives are so different than what I call the regular people. Um, <laughs> they, um, I'm not offended. <laughs> But I'll, I'll move over to this side a little bit. Um, anytime you're making a decision on something to add for your financial well-being, look at where you're at at that moment. Look at the picture you've started to create. Think of it as a mosaic where you're adding tiles and you're creating a picture that's unique to you. Today, it might be better to work on this section. Tomorrow, maybe on this section. So you have you know yourself better than anybody else. You know, Are you someone that is gonna take a really active role in, in researching you know, something to invest in and following, you know, buying individual stocks and following that. Or at this moment, is that something you're really interested in doing? But maybe a year from now, you're gonna be busy doing a film shoot and you don't have time to do that and you want something that's on autopilot. Maybe at that time, it's better to have something like an acorn that's just doing everything for you and you don't have to think about it. Or you need a financial advisor 
that you want you want to say, look, I want you to take control of this. Can I just say one thing about like I never I never suggest letting someone just take control of your of your money. I just don't. I was just going to qualify before <laughs> yeah. you jumped in because I was going to say the whole point is be educated enough to understand what you're having someone do for you. That doesn't mean you have to do it yourself, mm -hmm. but you don't want to not understand what somebody's like doing. Like she was talking about too, understanding the fees and transparency. Exactly, and really exactly, because that's when you can get taken ask. advantage of, and that's right. why fiscal literacy is so important to me, because whether you decide to do it yourself or you decide to have someone else help you do it, mm -hmm. you, need to know something. you understand enough about it that you're not flying blind on it. Mm -hmm. Yes. So you should be able to. Your your if you work with a person, it should be like going to your doctor. They should be as close to you. You mm -hmm. should be able to tell your doctor anything because if they if they don't know what's going on, they can't help you. It's the same thing with an advisor. If he's not willing to sort of communicate and sort of tell you things in great detail, I would kind of stay away from him just because I mean you it's it, it's a it's a conversation. You know, it's empowering for you to know what's happening to make informed decisions. That's true in every facet of your life. You know, if you if you work with someone and they're very sort of hands off, or you don't feel comfortable talking to them, and asking them questions. That's like a gut thing, and you should probably find someone else. This is like going to a doctor. You should be, be able to tell your doctor anything, and they should be able to tell you anything. And if you don't have that kind of rapport, then I would be a little. It's, it's, I mean, that's not doesn't mean they're a bad person. It just means that you need someone you can talk to and who will communicate with you because you want to gain knowledge. You don't want to have someone just. You don't. You can't just. I mean, I, you know. If, again, situations happen. I completely agree with you that sometimes you don't have the time to manage it, but you should be on top of it. And there's nothing wrong with having money and. All those different things. You know, you could have a financial advisor that's managing part of your portfolio that you don't really have to worry about too much, except, you know, you touch in with, you have some maybe individual stocks that you're buying on your own for fun because you, because it's exciting. Buying individual stocks is fun, you know? Walking into McDonald's and saying, I own part of you <laughs> is a lot more fun than saying, oh, I have these shares of a large cap mutual fund, you know, big whoop, you know? McDonald's is something tangible that you can hold. I'm not suggesting you buy a McDonald's. Um, but so maybe you have, you know, it, the other thing as artists is, 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 you know, you have to follow where your interests are and we're, we're very curious about things. And so there's nothing wrong with having different pieces of your money in different places that, you know, sometimes you have time to put your attention there, sometimes you don't. What you don't want to do is have it so spread out that you can't keep track of it, because there's nothing that makes me crazier than to see, you know, like in the Sunday paper when they say, you know, these lost accounts where, you know, these people have forgotten they had a bank account that had $4,000 in it. I'm like, who are these oh. people that have forgotten $4,000 in their bank account? You know, and why can't, you know, have it be me? So. Um, <laughs> So be careful that you don't become so spread out that you can't keep track of it. But don't be afraid to, you know, try different things and have little pieces here and there because that's diversification as well. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much, Fonzo. Awesome. Thank you. David, thank for you coming guys. tonight. Appreciate it. Have a great night. <laughs>